few diseases invoke the horror that Ebola does, and for good reason. Ebola virus multiplies explosively in the human body. It is an incredibly powerful virus, and to this day, although much is known about Ebola, much remains quite mysterious. Scientific experiments have suggested that as little as one infectious particle can start a fatal infection. And yet, health workers and epidemiologists know how to contain this virus. The question is whether they can avoid societal roadblocks to implementing their plans. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. At the time of production of this episode, the latest Ebola epidemic had claimed more than 2,000 lives in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But some good news has emerged, despite the suffering. New medical breakthroughs that might prevent and even cure this devastating disease. But as the health crisis is embedded in local politics, the efforts to stop Ebola come down to a race between the virus and the vagaries of human nature. Find out what's at stake and whether the world is prepared for pandemics in the future. It's Stopping Ebola. Ebola's vicious destruction gives it an air of omnipotence, a malevolent supernatural force. But it's not that. It's just a bit of biology. Some scientists even debate whether a virus, a snippet of genetic code wrapped in a protein, even meets the definition of life. Basically, the Ebola virus is simply a tiny, tightly curled strand of RNA. Many of the uh, researchers, the virologists who study Ebola, speak about the beauty of Ebola virus. It's a very peculiar kind of beauty, but when you look at it in a microscope, you're looking deep into the heart of nature, and you're seeing something that is essential to life on the planet. Viruses probably originated uh, among the very earliest stirrings of life on the planet. Like other viruses that cause hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola evolved in our wildest, most ancient places, coexisting with other living things. It'll let us be if we let it be, but we're not doing that. We no longer control our environment, you know, with the climate change and we are getting closer to the forest, we are getting closer to some of the wild animals. So definitely those contacts that has not been there before expose us to some new virus, Lassa fever, Ebola, and many more to come. So what happens when we disturb this viral sleeping monster? One journalist has written extensively about what occurs when Ebola enters a new, unsuspecting host. I'm Richard Preston. I'm a writer. I'm the author of a number of books, including my most recent one, Crisis in the Red Zone. Earlier, he said that it takes but one particle of Ebola to cause a fatal infection. Let's try to picture that tiny bit of virus. It's not airborne. It infects by direct contact. If you have a particle of Ebola on your fingertip and rub your eye, which people do unconsciously all the time, that particle can move through the membrane of the eyelid, enter a capillary, and from there make its way through your entire vascular system. The particle is a tiny thread of flotsam. It's jiggly and rubbery. It flips and flops and twists in the currents of the blood. It bumps against red blood cells but slides off them, doesn't stick to them. If the particle were the size of a small shred of spaghetti, then a red blood cell would be the size of a dinner plate. The Ebola particle passes through the heart and lungs, traveling in the flow of the blood, and it enters the system of arteries, which lead away from the heart to all parts of the body. 60 seconds after the Ebola particle has landed on the person's eyelid, it can be anywhere in the person's body. Eventually, somewhere in the body, the particle sticks to a cell. The core of the particle gets pulled inside the cell. Now one Ebola particle is sitting inside one cell in the person's body. At this point, the person may be doomed. These Ebola particles replicate furiously, targeting immune cells and the vascular system. Now for those of you who stayed up all night reading Richard Preston's nonfiction thriller, The Hot Zone, about how a relative of the Ebola virus infected a primate facility in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., I bet you still shudder at the terrifying description of what Ebola does to a body. A caution that what follows includes graphic description. 
the virus particles are multiplying in all the major organs of the body, but particularly in the liver. And as time goes by, you begin to get episodes of diarrhea, projectile vomiting, in which um, the vomitus is thrown up to two meters or six feet through the air. It's highly infective liquid. Other people can be infected by this. And you sweat profusely. It turns out that human sweat is loaded with Ebola particles. And then as the disease culminates in death, there's a false dawn. The person begins to seem as if they're recovering, but they may be having episodes of melina, which is basically blood coming out of the anus. It is black in color and bloody vomit. And then typically they go into what's known as the crash, where the person suddenly collapses into shock. The blood pressure goes to zero and the person dies. But the odd truth of Ebola is that when a person dies of Ebola virus, the exact cause of death remains unknown. We do not know how Ebola virus kills a human being. Now, in the Hot Zone, which was published 25 years ago now, you, you, your terrifying description of Ebola still sits with many people, I think. But you did include a description that said that along with the hemorrhaging, this intense hemorrhaging, the internal organs liquefy. And that is a detail that experts have criticized, um, saying that the organs actually remain intact. I mean, Ebola is scary enough. Why did you write that the organs liquefied? Well, you know what? They're absolutely right, and that's an error in the hot zone. I wrote that because it was based on Colonel Nancy Jax's description of what she saw when she was doing necropsies of dead monkeys that had died of Ebola a year. And what she observed in the monkey was this rapid liquefaction and deterioration of the internal organs of the animal. But monkeys are small. A monkey with a high fever is going to decay really rapidly. So that may be what Colonel Jacks was seeing. In any case, the book has been rightly criticized for overemphasizing that biological meltdown element of Ebola. It is absolutely a horrible disease, but you don't have to have a biological meltdown to be frightened by Ebola. The current outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, is the second deadliest on record. The first was in West Africa, beginning in 2014, when the death toll surpassed 11,000. That outbreak eventually affected both Europe and the U.S. Mr. Preston's book, Crisis in the Red Zone, describes these events. He says, we think we now know how the West Africa Ebola outbreak started a chance interaction a few days before Christmas 2013 when a toddler named Emil in the Guinea village of Meliandu was with his mother and other kids at a local washing pool. Not far from that pool there was a large ancient dead tree, uh, a remnant of the great West African tropical forest which has for the most part now been cut down and devastated. And inside the tree, there was an enormous bat colony of a particular species of bat that the Kissy people call the flying mouse. The children of the village are known to eat these small gray flying mice. Now, the kids liked to occasionally build a small fire in the base of the tree. The smoke from the fire would go up through the tree, which would disorient the bats. Some of them would get dizzy and fall down to the ground. The kids would then poke them with sticks and roast them over a fire the way you roast a marshmallow. And then they would share that on a stick. Now, this little kid, Emil, was about a year and a half old. He was too young to be able to roast these bats or take part in that. But he may have played with a bat, or he may have been offered a bat by another kid. The bat may have been sick. We don't know for sure. But somehow or other, it is believed that he probably contracted Ebola virus infection from one of these bats. We don't know that. It's never been proven. But there doesn't seem to be any other likely explanation. Now, what happened was that the virus had made what is known as a cross-species jump out of its original natural host and gotten into a new host, the human body, this kid. It uh, multiplied explosively in a meal, and shortly after Christmas 2013, he died with black diarrhea. <laughs> 
The virus moved on quickly from Emil, claiming the life of his mother and his grandmother, jumping over the border into a village in Sierra Leone. It was in this town that the epidemic accelerated, burning through its unwitting human hosts like wildfire. There is this ridiculous thing that you kind of get from the media that Africans have curious burial practices that encourages the spread of Ebola. That's absolutely ridiculous. When my father passed away, uh, my mother and I and my brother were with him, and I couldn't help but touch his face as he was leaving this world. This was my father. I, I loved him. You know, we, we naturally want to have contact with lives that are being lost. That very human impulse could be seen in the villagers' response to the death of a faith healer named Menendor. And when she died, there was a, a tremendous outpouring of grief and a funeral in her village, which was attended by at least 200 people, maybe more. And their affection for Menendor just went through the crowd like, like fire. And they threw themselves upon her, on her corpse, which lay on a bier. They caressed her, they wept over her, they touched her. Uh, and Ebola particles, uh, they come out onto the skin, and then they are known to be able to sit on the skin of a dead corpse for up to seven days if they're kept out of direct sunlight. They remain able to replicate, they remain potent. So as people touched Menindor, then they touched each other, uh, these expressions of grief. And the virus was just spread all through the crowd as people touched one another and touched Menindor. Then they went home to their villages. Now, this is an illustration of what Ebola really is as a life form. It is a parasite, and the virus travels on acts of love, acts of care, and acts of tenderness that occur between people when people touch one another, when they support one another and help one another. And the virus itself, what is driving the virus? What does it want from the world? What does Ebola virus want? What a great question. The virus can be thought of as a small biological nanomachine. And it is programmed for only one thing. Like all other forms of life, its mission is to recreate itself through time. And the virus as a parasite must do this by infecting humans or hosts. It's only in the cells of a host that the virus can copy itself and sustain its existence over indefinite periods of time. In other words, its quest is to make itself immortal. And as it emerged from the ecosystem in West Africa and penetrated the human species for the first time, it found fertile ground for replicating itself and for its existence over time. But viruses, when they move from one host to a different kind of host, very typically they change. They adapt. They're like all other forms of life. They adapt to their new environment. And because a virus has a fast life cycle, because it copies itself rapidly, it can adapt rapidly. And as Ebola moved into the human population and began chaining its way through larger and larger numbers of people, it changed. It began mutating. And Within a very short period of time, what appears to be an extremely hot strain of Ebola emerged in West Africa. There's been criticism that the story of the Ebola outbreaks, until recently, perhaps, um, has always been told from the perspective of the Western doctors, and they've been portrayed as the heroes. You dedicated this book, Crisis in the Red Zone, to the nurses and health workers in the Kenema Government Hospital. And I wonder if you could just describe for us, give a portrait of, of what life was like for them during the height of the outbreak. They were working 12 hours a day, making maybe $5 a day, <laughs> the nurses were. And it's a scene that is unimaginable for anyone who has not either read about it or experienced it. What were they doing to protect their nation and the world? Well, they were basically in the middle of a war. It was a different kind of war. It was a virus war and they were working in wards that were completely overwhelmed with Ebola patients. These were wards that were designed to hold 12 patients and had 40 patients in them. These are people who are desperately sick with Ebola. There are body fluids everywhere, all over the place. There are cadavers lying in beds because there isn't enough staff around to even remove dead bodies from the beds. 
There were people two to a bed, even three to a bed. There were children lying next to adults, children dying next to adults, adults dying next to children who were alive. And meanwhile, the staff, those who could bear it, continued to work. They would put on their PPE, their biohazard outfits. They would go in. They would work. There were nurses who worked really literally 12-hour shifts. But, you know, no matter what kind of precautions you take, if you're in an environment like that, you're basically in the middle of the biological equivalent of a, a melted nuclear reactor. The virus was everywhere. And so, ultimately, the nurses and staff began getting sick and dying, and then ending up in the wards being cared for by their, their fellow nurses, who then, in turn, died. So they were doing this work with the full knowledge that they would probably die. They were doing it for the same way that soldiers go into battle where they think they won't survive. They were doing it for their country and for their community. And they were doing it because they felt it was their duty as medical professionals to hold the line. And when it was all over, there were some who survived. There were many who died. And when the genomic scientists looked at the data, they found that the virus had been transmitted among the hospital staff from one professional to another. They often contracted the virus by giving care to their colleagues who were dying. Two Americans caught Ebola, I mean, more than just two Americans, but two Americans caught Ebola and were brought back to the U.S. for treatment. They were given an experimental drug. And I think anyone who remembers the news reports at that time remember that the alarm about Ebola was ringing quite loud, that Ebola was now in the U.S. It was practically in our backyards. Um, Some of the reports sounded almost hysterical. But in reading your book, we learned that the threat to Americans is not exactly how it was reported. I'm just correcting the record here. Yeah, let's correct the record. There was no threat at all from the American health workers who were brought into the United States. And why is that? None whatsoever. Why? Well, they were surrounded by technology. Each one of those individuals was cared for by a team of 21 doctors and nurses and a full-scale biocontainment facility. I'm talking about a level four hospital unit. There are only about... I think four of them in the United States. There are not many at all. Hospital units that are full biocontainment and that can handle a patient like that. But there were 11 people with Ebola in the United States. Those who were given medical treatment, millions and millions of dollars were spent saving them and simultaneously protecting the population from the spread of this virus, which is inherently very dangerous. And I heard an interesting story One of the patients, a nurse from that hospital, the Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas, who had Ebola, was brought to the National Institutes of Health in Maryland, where she was put into their biocontainment unit there. And the chief of infectious diseases at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Anthony Fauci, personally cared for her. He's the guy who runs it all. And he went in there, and he became a member of her team of physicians. Richard Preston is the author of The Hot Zone and Crisis in the Red Zone. The current Ebola health crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo is unfolding amidst a political crisis that is interfering with the efforts to contain the disease. We speak to a journalist who's been reporting from the DRC next. It's Stopping Ebola on Big Picture Science. It works. Well, let's be honest. No one's going to say that about your deodorant, but with Native, you don't have to have any doubts. And Native offers more than just reassurance. It's made with fewer, simpler ingredients. None of that laundry list of strange-sounding compounds you'll find in the chemical handbook. Native has garnered over 7,000 five-star reviews in places like Women's Health, Good Morning America, Nylon, and, well, more. You can get native in pleasant but not overwhelming scents, such as coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint, or, if you're a purist, totally unscented. And a special deal for BiPiSci listeners. 20% off your first purchase if you go to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS, as in big picture science. 20% off. Just mouse over to 
nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS. Native Deodorant. Effective and, to be honest, simply better. When the Democratic Republic of Congo declared an Ebola outbreak in 2018, two years after the end of the West African Ebola outbreak, the world was, if not ready, at least better prepared. International and African health responders swiftly acted with the knowledge that Ebola can be contained. Enforcing a quarantine works. Preventing contact with infected people and animals works. We're talking about stopping Ebola in this episode, but now we come to confounding factors, non-biological factors. We'll hear in a moment about how fear and suspicion are hampering public health efforts to contain the virus. For example, some Congolese infected with Ebola do not want to go to treatment centers. And that seems strange. Why would people suffering from the disease avoid medical assistance? For perspective, author Richard Preston found it useful to turn things around. Well, in the course of researching Crisis in the Red Zone, I spent time with West Africans, especially at the Kenema Hospital in Kenema. And in the course of this, I just began to understand that this was no different than any other place on Earth. This was just a community. This was a town. And these were people who were well-equipped to deal with whatever the world throws at them. But they were absolutely overwhelmed by in a situation that nobody could manage or control. And I thought about what it would be like, actually, from the point of view of a local person when these foreigners come in. If a group of powerful foreigners who spoke no English or spoke it badly with a heavy accent were to set up a camp of tents in suburban Wellesley, Massachusetts, and they were wearing biohazard moon suits and were telling townspeople that an extreme virus had gotten loose in Wellesley and that anybody who had symptoms must go into the camp and stay there until they died, there might be some opposition from the Wellesleyites. And if most people who went into the camp were never seen again, dead or alive, and if the foreigners were burying white body bags next to the camp, and if quite a few of the bags obviously held dead children, and if social media lit up with rumors of hideous experiments, it's a pretty sure bet that the Wellesleyites would be reaching for their guns and doing anything they could to get the hell out of Wellesley. In addition to the bizarre, nightmarish reality of dealing with the Ebola epidemic, health workers and journalists in the DRC have received death threats and some have been killed. In October 2019, a local journalist who had been involved in raising awareness with his community about the disease was killed in his home and his home burned down. This murder occurred just months after the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ahanam Ghebreyesus, announced a geographic expansion of the disease. As you know, over the weekend, a man from Butembo took a bus to Goma, a city of two million people on the border with Rwanda, and the gateway to the rest of DRC and the world. On his arrival in Goma, the man, a pastor, visited a health center where he was diagnosed with Ebola. He has since died. Separately, last Thursday, a woman with Ebola symptoms from DRC crossed the border to buy fish at a market in Uganda. On Friday, she was diagnosed with Ebola and treated in DRC. She too has died. Although there is no evidence yet of local transmission in either Goma or Uganda, These two events represent a concerning geographical expansion of the virus. In order to draw global attention to the epidemic, the UN agency declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. My name is Amy Maxman. I'm a senior reporter at Nature. She has been reporting for months on the Ebola outbreak. Her most recent piece, which appeared in a September issue of the journal Nature, the one that we talked to her about, describes how political unrest is interfering with efforts to stop Ebola, in part because it's fueling conspiracy theories. So the way the whole trip kind of started for me was the head of the World Health Organization wrote me and he said, I really want you to come out and write about this because it was getting no media attention. And we should say, I think he's the first African to hold that position, to be the, the head of the World Health Organization. 
And why is it not getting media attention? And did he mean it's not getting enough attention worldwide or in the West? You know, I don't really know what he meant, but I do know from what I saw is it is not getting the attention if you compare it to the outbreak in West Africa. It's really not getting any attention. And it's something, you know, we can only speculate on why. One idea is we haven't had any cases come to the U.S. And DRC is an interesting country in that it's been ignored for a really long time. There's like horrible conflict that's gone on there for 20 years and... It's not the kind of place where people go on safaris. So on the whole, I think people just don't seem that interested. Describe an Ebola treatment facility. So is, is, is it a building? Is it a mobile van? So it can be in any of these things. So it could be in a hospital that's been now converted to be an Ebola treatment unit or Ebola treatment center. It could be in a big tent. But the main thing that defines it is that you've got a place where patients who have not yet had a confirmed diagnosis are clearly triaged. So they won't get Ebola from patients. Doctors Without Borders, for example, like has sort of a recipe for what this takes, and they set them up quick. In the meantime, this group, Alima, another NGO, thought of this Ebola treatment unit that's really interesting where they have these clear plastic cubes. So people with Ebola are inside of a plastic cube, which is actually quite nice because they can see out, you know, their family members can see in. So it's not as isolating as it might be inside of a giant tent that's opaque. Is there just one person in the, one patient in the cube at a time? In these Alima centers, yeah, just one patient at a time. And they've started this new thing where now they hire survivors of Ebola because they're immune to sit by the bedside. So often you'll pass by a cot with a person on it and there'll just be a survivor also in there with them. Can you take us through what happens when it is suspected that someone has Ebola? How are the sick identified? How are they cared for? And Are they moved from home? Are they treated at home? Or are they moved into one of these treatment centers? So ideally, like in the best case scenario, somebody feels sick and they go to their health clinic and the nurse at the clinic or the doctor at the clinic knows the signs of Ebola and protects themselves. And then, you know, alerts an Ebola response person who might take them to a triage area where their blood can be taken and then they're tested and then they move to an Ebola treatment unit. That's what happens in an ideal world. What really seems to happen a large amount of the time, at least when I was there in July, and it might be getting slightly better now, is that people, because of, you know, mistrust and just sort of like if you have to make a decision and you have a child who's really sick, rather than roll the dice and send them to this strange new center, you might prefer to keep them closer to home and keep going to the same doctor or pharmacist or healer that you already know. So what was happening or when I was there was that A lot of people, first they'd visit their pastor or they'd go visit somebody who sort of is a pharmacist and they might have herbal treatments or just regular like Tylenol type treatments. And then when they get sicker, maybe they'll go to their local clinician. So a number of days would pass before they would go to an Ebola treatment center. And presumably they may be infectious during that time. Yeah. Now your reporting makes it clear that understanding the political context of the Ebola outbreak is essential into understanding the potential success in stopping an outbreak. I wonder if you could just give us an overview of the kind of conflict that is underway in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the eastern DRC has had ongoing conflict for 20 plus years. So the area has more UN troops than anywhere else in the world. And it's been a constant site of instability for a really long time. And how has the armed conflict and the local politics conspired to prevent effective Ebola therapies from reaching everyone in need? Okay, so into this context, we have the Ebola outbreak. And then now you have the government who has never helped this area. Like, there's not a regulated health system There's been this ongoing conflict, and people see that their government is not protecting them. So you've got now the government saying, oh, now you should come into our strange new Ebola treatment centers. And people often don't leave those treatment centers, and you don't really see in. So there's mistrust. There's mistrust of the treatment centers because there's mistrust of the the government and and officials. And I assume that that extends to the health officials who are trying to help. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and as far as uh, the World Health Organization is an agency within the United Nations and aid workers. And so people have memories of aid workers only preferentially helping some people So the question is, why should anyone then go ahead and trust that anybody's there to help them? And now on top of that, 
even though there's people with the Ministry of Health who are actually genuinely trying to help people, the president decides that nobody in the East and like these two large cities in the East and North Kivu are allowed to vote because of Ebola. So if anybody had any suspicions that this was just a political tool, that kind of confirmed it in everybody's mind. So that's when things really get bad for the Ebola response. And there's evidence that you cite in your in your stories that the Ebola treatment centers are not just casualties in this conflict, but they're being deliberately targeted. And in fact, the image that has stayed with me from your most recent story is the Ebola treatment center that was torched while sick patients sat in their beds, helpless to do anything. And the people who could move, the patients who could move, ran into the jungle. Why would these treatment centers be targets? So because this outbreak had been politicized, because the former president barred these cities from voting, this link was made that government and Ebola are one. These things are related. Well, government and Ebola may be be one in in some people's minds, but what about the Ebola patients? I mean, Mm. and and also why target a treatment center when it would be in the self-interest of everyone to stop the spread of the disease? If you don't believe Ebola is a real virus that is just spread independent as a virus, then you would. And I think there was a number of rumors that this was something that government and or aid workers who are working with the government have brought in to kill people. So an idea was that the Ebola sensors are actually places where people are being killed. Maybe their organs are being harvested or maybe it's just another way to marginalize people because already people felt like their lives aren't valued very much because why else would you have an armed group come in and kill people and have a government or the UN not do anything about it? And I should say most people in these communities are not attacking Ebola treatment centers, but that did happen. And there's supposedly, I talked to one woman from Doctors Without Borders who was at one of their Ebola treatment units that was attacked and She just says it was terrifying because they were attacked twice, actually, and both times it was at specific points when they had a lot of people in the center. So they did it to inflict the most terror. So somebody was watching. Did you witness any of the treatment centers being attacked? No, I did not see that at all. I went to one of them that had been rebuilt after an attack. Doctors Without Borders pulled out of the cities that had been attacked, so they left Butembo and Katwa. So then the Ministry of Health and the WHO took over some of those centers, and they rebuilt them, and they put snipers outside of those centers. And it also had this something that was, you know, crazy to me, and I've seen a number of Ebola treatment centers now. This one had this big, giant pit, like the size of a volleyball court or something, in the middle, and that was a kind of a bunker for people to run into if it was attacked again. And there was snipers' nests outside. There are a number of people, including MSF at times, Doctors Without Borders, that will say it's terrible to arm these Ebola treatment units because that's terrifying. If you're already afraid of the government or something and now there are soldiers standing outside of an Ebola treatment unit, why would you go there? And that's true. At the same time, think about those patients who are in their beds um, or think about the health workers who are working there. So it's, it's a really difficult problem. So let's get this straight because there's an important link here between the armed conflict and the terror and the spread of the disease that you haven't said directly but it is in your piece. So you have these violent attacks that either destroy the treatment centers or they kill the responders. A number of health officials have been killed. That if the health responders are not killed, um, they're at least sent scattering and they abandon treatment for a while. They have to because now the treatment center has been destroyed. And now you've created a vacuum for Ebola to spread. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. And the thing that happens is even if the attack isn't directly on an Ebola treatment unit, even, for example, when I was in Benny and there had been an attack, you know, it'll be things like two dead and three kidnapped, or these are the sort of horrible everyday reports you might hear about. When those things happen, for their own safety, the Ebola responders are not going to go out and circulate within the community those days. The Ebola response kind of clamps down and they don't go out and infiltrate through communities and talk to people and see who has fevers and give people vaccines and take temperatures. And then what happens next is, you know, a couple of weeks later, there'll be a huge uptick in the number of people who are found dead with Ebola or who report to centers with Ebola. So the outbreak spreads. So there's a direct relationship between the spread of this disease and, and the violent context under which it's unfolding. Yeah. I mean, I think we could pretty well predict where outbreaks are going to become epidemics. 
This is DRC's 10th Ebola outbreak. And what makes this outbreak the second worst ever and what made the West African outbreak the worst ever is systems being totally broken down in these areas. So other parts of DRC, DRC does have infrastructure problems everywhere and they do have a lot of conflict. But the East is, you know, notoriously one of the most fragile places on the globe. Amy Maxman, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. Amy Maxman is a senior reporter at Nature. Her work on the Ebola outbreak is supported by a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and you can find a link to her most recent article on our website, bigpicturescience.org. You should expect to see more stories from her. Two days after we spoke with Ms. Maxman, she returned to Africa to continue reporting on the disease. The Washington Post has since put her reporting in a global context, in a piece that notes how deadly infectious outbreaks occurring in conflict zones, where civic institutions are collapsing, are a problem that is playing out across the world. For example, the WHO reports that a civil war in Yemen has led to an epidemic of cholera. Now, for some good news, and it's very good news. As we were putting together this episode, an announcement was made about the world's first clinically proven Ebola vaccine. We will talk about it with a scientist in Cameroon next. By the way, if you have thoughts about this show or other episodes that you'd like to share, you can connect with us on social media. On Twitter, we are at BiPiSci. It's Stopping Ebola on Big Picture Science. Let's get right to the encouraging news about Ebola, news that would have seemed unfathomable even five years ago during the deadly West African outbreak. We now have two high-efficacy drugs to combat the virus, but there's more. While we were putting together this program, there was news of an effective Ebola vaccine. It's really important between the outbreak in West Africa and now we have a tool that can prevent Ebola. That's just great. The European Commission approved licensing the Ebola vaccine Ervabo produced by the pharmaceutical company Merck. License means that the commission has reviewed the results of clinical trials and has concluded that they meet the efficacy and safety standards required for use. This promises to be a game changer in the fight against the disease. I'm uh, Professor Yaboum. I'm the representative for Africa of Epicentre, which is the research arm of Dr. Richard Borders. And I'm a professor of uh, microbiology at the University of Yaoundé 1 in uh, Cameroon. Yap, how, how does this vaccine work? Is it a, a one shot and you're protected for a lifetime kind of vaccine? So far, we don't know for how long it's going to protect people. We have some evidence that it will protect for at least two years. So the way it's used right now is to help people to stop an outbreak. So when there is one case, we use the vaccine as a way to control and to stop the transmission. What, what about the effectiveness? I, I think I read somewhere that the vaccine is 70 to 100 percent effective. How does that stack up against other vaccines? I mean, you know, I, I get vaccines against smallpox when I was a kid, and I assume that's pretty much 100% effective. How effective is this vaccine? This one is between 75 to 100%, meaning that there is a very high probability that you are protected when you use the vaccine. But have in mind that the vaccine is not the only way to protect against a disease. For Ebola, for example, you need to wash hands and many other things. You still have to follow all the other rules. All right. So uh, suppose we take an, a region, I don't know, maybe in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the, the DRC. For example. For example. It's not a random <laughs> example, I suppose. Yeah. But, but we take some region there and there is a, uh, uh, a case, a single case, of Ebola that's detected there. And, you know, the people have been vaccinated with this with this new pharmaceutical, this new vaccine. What 
number of cases would you expect to develop there? You know, what fraction of the population would contract Ebola compared to, say, 10 years ago? Well, I don't know if we can compare in terms of number, but what I know is if there is one case and then we come as soon as possible, let's say within three or five days, and we vaccinate all the people who have been in contact with that person, the chance that there is not a second case are really high. If you see what happened in Uganda, for example, they vaccinated all the health workers who were at the border between them and DRC, and then they had only one case. So the vaccine must have played a huge role on stopping the outbreak in Uganda. In DRC, for example, more than 300,000 people have received the vaccine. And we believe that it has played a role helping us to reduce and to limit the outbreak, as you are saying. It has not ended yet, but it could have been worse than that. All right. Well, that, that sounds extremely encouraging. Uh, just sort of a technical point. If you detect somebody in a region who gets Ebola, you come in uh, with the trucks, you bring in the vaccine, and you get everybody in that area to be vaccinated. I mean, many of them have presumably already been exposed to this person who has the disease. Does the vaccine still work if you've already been exposed? Yeah, that's the point. It's a race between the virus and the vaccine, which means there is a window between one and 10 days where the vaccine might work. If it's too late, if the person has been exposed for more than 10 days, the chances are very limited. But if we are still in the first days, that's when the vaccine will actually be able to protect that person, but also those who are in contact with the person who is having Ebola. Now, the idea of producing a vaccine, uh, yep, that goes back, I mean, nearly three centuries. I'm thinking, of course, of Edward Jenner and his smallpox <laughs> vaccine in England. Yeah. You know, uh, but the idea was pretty straightforward. You essentially give people a shot of uh, the inactive disease, if you will, and their immune system develops antibodies and so forth. What has made it so difficult to develop a vaccine against Ebola? I mean, if, if Edward Jenner could do this three centuries ago, what, what's so difficult? Well, I think someone say that where there is a will, there is a way. When the, the first case went out of West Africa, going to Spain, going to the U.S., going to France, and also when the number was huge, I think at some point people start fearing and really fearing because that was not the first Ebola outbreak, but this was the first going out of control. So I think that fear has really motivated people to do all what was possible. Well, that sounds like uh, it, it, it one of those cases where not my problem. If I, you know, if nobody's getting Ebola in my my country, I don't care about it. I mean, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, if you are based in the U.S., why why will you pay your taxes to, to, to go and find a vaccine that is not going to come back to you? Some people might say that's not our problem. By the time you realize that it can be your problem because those virus don't fear any borders, then you say it might come to me then, therefore I have to protect myself, and protecting myself is making sure that those people have the tools. Moving on from prevention to cure, Yap. What's the status of drugs used to treat people who have already contracted Ebola? Yes, for the first time, we have those two drugs, the MAB-114 and the Regen, who can be used for people who have already contracted the disease, they are sick, and there, the earlier they can receive those drugs based on the antibodies for people who have been having the disease some time back, because it's important to highlight that the MAB-114 was discovered by Professor Muyembe, who was actually the guy who discovered Ebola in 1976. And he used the blood of patients from Kikwit outbreak in 1995 to produce that drug. So it's a drug that is curing Ebola, but it's also a great story of how people, because of the commitment of perseverance, managed to find something from those patients to treat the new patient. So now Ebola is preventable, but it's also curable. Well, when you say curable, roughly what percentage of the people who have Ebola can be cured with a new, uh, with a new pharmaceutical? The latest evidence, uh, people who come in the early stage has 90% chance of getting cured. 
90 percent that that's pretty good that's pretty good we we are looking forward to have the full report and all those full evidence but that's more or less what we know for today so it's a major advance that deserve a Nobel Prize of Medicine, for example. I would think so. I mean, this is, it sounds like we're turning Ebola from, you know, some horror for which there's no out into a treatable disease. Yes, yes. Though it's important to mention that that's not enough. You can have the vaccine, you can have the drug, but if the outbreak is happening in Congo, in a place where there is conflict, it makes things more difficult because you cannot access the patient. If you cannot access them, you cannot vaccinate them, you cannot treat them. Yap, you're on the ground there. I mean, this is not a theoretical discussion. Uh, you're, you're, you know, not terribly far from the DRC. I think <laughs> at least one of the borders of Cameroon gets pretty close to it. How has yeah. the development of these new treatments, both the vaccine and the drugs, uh, affected your job, your day-to-day? I mean, what, what do you see that's fundamentally different now? Well, I don't know. When you see me, it's me as a researcher, an African researcher who is really proud to have African researcher being part of such a discovery. So uh, it's affecting me in the way that it's inspiring other African researchers to find solutions for our continent. Well, finally, Yap. Is the era of the Ebola horror coming to a close? I mean, that that sounds like kind of a trivial question because it sounds like it is. But I mean, do you see Ebola as sort of, you know, moving into something that was terrible only in the past? Yes, I think so. I, I, I think that we are getting there. We are getting there. And that is a real big change. That's, those people are making history. Yup, boom. Thanks so very much for speaking with us today. My real pleasure, real pleasure. And thank you for inviting me to share my, my happiness. It's a good day. Yap Boom is a professor of microbiology at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon, and he is a representative for Africa for Epicent, the research arm for Doctors Without Borders. Now for some final thoughts. 25 years ago, I was one of the readers gripped by Richard Preston's The Hot Zone. These exotic, infectious agents were both fascinating and terrifying. At the end of the book, Mr. Preston predicted that Ebola would be back, and he was correct. Well, we've since heard that the tools of science have advanced so that, as Dr. Boom said, there is genuine optimism about making Ebola a curable disease. But we are not out of the woods. At the end of his most recent book, Mr. Preston cautions that we are still vulnerable to pandemics, and I was surprised to learn what infections are his top candidates, because they are not the ones that kept me up at night 25 years ago. My money is not on Ebola for a global pandemic, a level four occurrence, a level four event. And the reason is because Ebola transmits through direct contact with fluids. But there are viruses, and one of them, an example of it, is the measles virus. These are types of viruses that travel exclusively or almost entirely in the air in dried form. So a virus like that, there's a whole family of them. They're called morbilloviruses, of which measles is but one example. When you speak or when you cough, tiny droplets of moisture come out of your mouth. The moisture droplets are so small that they dry almost instantly when they hit the air. Virus particles are even smaller than those droplets. So if a person is emitting particles of virus from the membranes of their mouth or from their lungs, and the virus is going into the air in these little droplets, it dries. And then it becomes effectively a kind of crystallized dust. And this dust can be incredibly infectious and it can travel long distances. So in the case of measles, in an unimmunized population, if you have a classroom with kids in it, and one person walks through the room and walks out, and that person is infected with measles, 90% of the kids in that room will get measles. It is incredibly infectious in closed air environments. Now think about uh, the kinds of closed air spaces that you find in cities around the world where you have millions of people crammed into small spaces. And in some of these cities in the developing world, you might have as many as 20 million people living in an urban area, and they don't have good access to medical care, to doctors, to sanitation, and they're living in crowded conditions. If an airborne hot agent were to get going anywhere, including let's just use New York as an example, 
it would be very, very difficult to control. And what would we actually do to control it? Well, I made a little survey and I found out that nationwide there are less than 500 so-called red zone beds, hospital beds, that are equipped to handle a patient with a really dangerous infectious organism. 500? Less than 500, yeah. And there are also very few trained medical staff, nurses and doctors, who would know how to handle a patient who is infected with an airborne hot agent. So my money is on, for the moment anyway, it's on the Morbilla viruses, and it's also on influenza, which is another virus that could mutate. You know, influenza is a very dangerous virus, and it travels easily from person to person. Richard Preston is a writer and the author, most recently, of Crisis in the Red Zone, the story of the deadliest Ebola outbreak in history and of the outbreaks to come. So what I've learned here, you know, stepping back, looking at the big picture, is that to begin with, even the most horrifying diseases are in the end just biology. You know, it's mindless <laughs> biology. Biology is not really out to get you. It's just what biology does. And that is amenable to treatment by science. So and what you're saying is that we are susceptible to the virus, but the virus is also vulnerable to us. Yeah, but the other thing that we've learned is that social factors, which you might think would be irrelevant. I mean, everybody will take advantage of the science, right? Well, that's not necessarily true, and not just in certain parts of the world. I mean, in our own part of the world, right, they're the people who don't trust vaccines and so forth. You know, science has a battle to win, and it isn't just against the biology. It's against our own biases and failures to appreciate what science can do. Well, we couldn't do this show without senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I am executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Sholsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the possibility of life on Mars. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak. Also, a big thanks to our listeners. Now, you may be listening to us on broadcast radio, but are you aware that you can also listen to Bi Pi Sci online by subscribing to the Bi Pi Sci podcast? You'll find links on our website to the platforms that carry us. <laughs>